Good morning and warm welcome to online analysis. Analysis update in Zoom platform sponsored by Akunda and hosted by Evan Rajit and our media partner is Analysis TV. Today's recent advances in analysis here. This month is dedicated to airway update. We have two eminent faculties in airway, Dr. Akesh Patra and Dr. Amit Vitsik. First, which is understanding and optimizing the laryngoscope in new area by Dr. Akesh Patra. That will be followed by Richard on focused airway ultrasound and armatorium in future airway management by Dr. Amit Dixit. Today's session is coordinated by Dr. Rajesh J. Professor, our team, team member. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, so today we have uh, two interesting topics on uh, airway management, which is a basic uh, for every anesthesiologist. And to have, we, we have two stalwarts in the same area. Uh, to discuss their views on the uh, topics. The first session will be uh, from Dr. Uh, Apish Patwa, sir, uh, uh, about uh, understanding and optimizing laryngoscopy in new era. Uh, Dr. Patwa, sir, is a is a uh, legend in the airway management and he is currently the general secretary of uh, All India Difficult Airway Association. And he had he was the one who had uh, actively involved in putting the uh, guidelines. Uh, especially this uh, All India uh, Difficult Airway Association uh, guidelines. And uh, he's a uh, faculty for a lot of conferences, uh, both uh, international, regional, uh, national conferences. And uh, he's uh, one who had designed some different types of uh, video laryngoscopes, like Patwasha uh, laryngoscope and uh, HFNPO uh, devices. And he had a lot of publications and he written uh, book chapters also. Uh, we welcome you, sir, Patra, sir, for your uh, topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for a kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Edward Johnson and uh, Team Online uh, for giving me opportunity to share my views and uh, to the PGs and consultants. Uh, thank you. I'm able to, should I able to share my screen? So, my are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. So, basically, my topic is uh, understanding and optimizing uh, laryngoscopy in this era. So, let's start with a different mode of uh, uh, session. It's a music. So video was not clear, but uh, I think most of you are able to hear the noise or hear the voice. So it's, it's, it was an opera music. So why I was started with the opera music? Because it's a tribute and salute to Manuel Garcia. He's, he's a, he was the inventor of laryngoscopy. He's known as father of laryngology. But if you look at his uh, designation, he was not an ENT surgeon. He was not an anesthesiologist, nor a doctor. He was a professor of singing and singer in Open House. He was the first person who has seen his own larynx. That's why the label of father of learning has been awarded to Dr. Manuel, Mr. Manuel Garcia. So my talk is on understanding and optimizing. What do you mean by optimizing? Optimizing laryngoscopy means getting best possible view. That's called optimizing laryngoscopy. And understanding laryngoscopy means perceiving the anatomy and performance of laryngoscopy with analytical thinking. That's called understanding of laryngoscopy. So usually we do a laryngoscopy. For what? We are create to, to create a direct line of sight and to create a passage for the channel for the endotical tube to facilitate intubation. That's the purpose of doing laryngoscopy. And it's having three components. First, we need to expose the larynx. Second, we, need, we have to make the entry into the vocal cord. And third, we have to 
make the passage for the endotracheal tube. So let's start with the first part, laryngeal exposure. In, in the, the, the uh, Macintosh Miller bridge was introduced in 1941. And two years later, Macintosh has introduced the cow blade. Both blades provide good laryngeal view. But optimal laryngeal view is depend on patient head and neck positioning. And in 1936, Maggie was the first person who explained to improve laryngeal view, just keep the pillow underneath the occiput and then extend the neck. And in 1944, Macbeth, Macbeth and Barrister has given the 3XL alignment theory. And they stated that flexion of CAC cervical spine and extension of the O joint align the oropharyngeal laryngeal axis. And that's the reason we are able to get the optimal laryngeal view. So, and this was not a proven thing. Still, it's not a proven thing. It's a hypothesis. And they will explain the hypothesis how XL 3 axis aligns and provide the laryngeal view. And after that, in 1989, the Horton was the person who has exactly defined the angle of cervical flexion and extension of the O joint. So it defined that neck flexion should be 35 degree and extension of the face plane should be 15 degree. Now, how to achieve this? And in a, in a common terms, we are using this as a sniffing position. We are labeling this position as a sniffing position. To give the sniffing position, you need to flex the spine. And to flex the cervical spine, at least you need to keep 8 to 10 centimeter height below under the occiput. And then you need to extend the face plane. So this is how, this is flexion of the cervical spine and this is extension of the O joint. And how to give the sniffing position? Look at this video. This is flexion of the C-spine. So O and this face plane extension. This is actual sniffing position. And if you look at this in image intensifier view, look at this. This is flexion of the cervical spine, and this will be extension of the O joint. So to give proper for sniffing position, you need to elevate the occiput at 8 to 10 centimeter height from the table and then extend the O joint. That is actually sniffing position. Fine. So since 2001, Miss 1944, Mike Bath and Benister has explained the three XL alignment, uh, alignment theory. And 2001, Adnet had contested the validity of sniffing position. And in, in eight volunteers MRI, he proved that sniffing position do not align the axis. But this study was criticized because only eight awake non-paralyzed patients were selected. No laryngoscopy was performed. Patient with the potential difficult airways were excluded. So what he did in the same year, he did another study for more than 396 patients. And he proved that the sniffing position do not improve the alignment of axis. And sniffing position is helpful in specifically in patients with the morbid obesity and with the patient with reduced cervical mobility. And he has suggested to use simple extension when you get difficulty in a, uh, of laryngoscopy in a sniffing position. And one another publication uh, by Dr. Lee, he has suggested to use 25 degree head-up position which improves the laryngeal view significantly. So if you look at the uh, across world publications about the sniffing position, then most of the publications favoring the sniffing position for providing the better laryngeal view. Whether it aligns the axis or not, that's a different matter. So, Adnes had proved that sniffing position do not align the axis. But sniffing positions provide the better laryngeal view. That is for sure. So, these two are different things. One, alignment of axis. And second, better laryngeal view. Optimal laryngeal view. So, if you look at the Malaysian Journal, if you look at the Hindwai publication, if you look at the uh, Kathmandu journal, whatever the journal you take, if you take uh, NSSA journal, whatever. So most of the journals, they are supporting the sniffing position for better laryngeal view. So that's the conclusion of all studies, most of all studies. Sniffing position provides the best laryngeal exposure.
whether it align the axis or do not align the axis is a different matter. So there are a lot of controversies among the positioning that has forced us to rethink about the laryngoscopy and which has come up with the new conceptual framework to understand the laryngoscopy and this framework makes the understanding easier for difficult laryngoscopy, why we get the difficult laryngoscopy. So according to this Edna, uh, Greenland's uh, new conceptual framework, there are two phases of laryngoscopy. One is static phase and another is dynamic phase of laryngoscopy. Static phase is governed by the posterior anatomical structure of the nail. It's called posterior complex. And dynamic phase is governed by the anterior anatomical structure of the neck, that's called anterior complex. So let's look at the static phase. So uh, our head and neck position has been governed by the C-spine and AO joint. So during laryngoscopy, before, do, before doing laryngoscopy, we need to give the sniffing, flex the C-spine and extend the AO joint. And we need to maintain that position Throughout, throughout the performance of laryngoscopy. So it's a static phase. We are not changing the position during the laryngoscopy. So any disturbance, and that's been governed by the posterior anatomical structure of the neck, that is C-spine and AO joint. So any disturbances in C-spine or AO joint leads to difficult positioning and so difficult laryngoscopy. This is the static phase. Now what is dynamic phase? So dynamic phase is a phase, means the anatomical changes which are taking place during the performance of the laryngoscopy is called dynamic phase of laryngoscopy. Like we are making a anatomical changes during the performance, like we are opening the mouth, we are retracting the tongue, we are lifting the epiglottis. These are actual anatomical changes happening during the laryngoscopy. That's why it's called dynamic phase of laryngoscopy and is governed by the anterior complex, anterior anatomical structure of the neck. Now, what is anterior complex? If you look at this, the, the, the area situated behind the hyoid bone is epiglottis, and area situated behind the thyroid cut is vocal. These are not part of anterior complex. So anterior complex is a imaginary pyramid and base of that pyramid is formed by the bilateral temporal mandibular joint and lower bottom incisor and apex is formed by the tip of the hyoid bone. So this is called anterior complex and if you look at the content of anterior complex, look at, look at here. So mainly the content of anterior complex is some mandibular tissue and tongue. You can very well appreciate the tongue movement into the anterior complex. Now what is the clinical significance of this anterior complex? Let's discuss something differently. So this is a mandibular ramus. Suppose there is a narrow mandibular ramus in case of, in case of receding mandible. So because of this narrow mandibular ramus, there is a confined space into the anterior complex and normal tongue, for a normal tongue, is not possible to accommodate into the anterior complex. And this tongue shifted down here into the hypopharynx and it's become a hypopharyngeal tongue. And we are able to retract the oropharyngeal tongue. We are not able to retract the hypopharyngeal tongue. And this leads to difficult laryngoscopy. We'll discuss in a diff another different uh, uh, scenario. Suppose this anterior complex, mandible is normal. This anterior complex is normal. But there is an enlargement of tongue in case of obesity. So because of excessive soft tissue enlargement in the tongue, See, this enlarged tongue, for enlarged tongue, is not possible to accommodate it by anterior complex. Again, this tongue shifted down here into the hypopharynx, and that's the culprit. And that's the reason of difficult mass ventilation and difficult intubation, as well as development of obstructive sleep apnea. And let's discuss about the higher position. See, higher is a free bone. It's uh, attached with the uh, two ligaments with the soft tissue. And epiglottis. So forward movement of hyoid bone open the airway and backward movement close the airway. And during dynamic phase of laryngoscopy, look at this video. This is the laryngoscopy in C2. This is mandible. This this one is hyoid bone, where my cursor is. Now, if I run a video, 
during dynamic phase of laryngoscopy iode is drawn anteriorly and forward at the same time mandible is also drawn anteriorly and forward and there is a total compression of the submandibular tissue between this blade and mandible in order to create a direct line of sight so there is significant amount of shift and compression during the dynamic phase of laryngoscopy so the success of direct laryngoscopy is depend on one clinicians clinicians or anesthetist ability to shift submandibular tissue and mandible make the mandible movement forward only then we are able to create a direct line of sight and we are able to uh, uh, create a channel for the passage of the endotracheal tube and again again this depend on volume of submandibular tissue like in case of acromegaly there is an enlarged tongue obesity there is an enlarged tongue that leads to difficult laryngoscopy compliance of the submandibular tissue like in case of angioneuritic edema uh, ludwig sanjana there is less compliance of the submandibular tissue we are not able to compress that tongue we are not able to shift that tongue leads to difficult laryngoscopy so this concept explains everything about the difficult laryngoscopy now if you look at the range of temporal and mandibular uh, joint movement as we know that during dynamic phase of laryngoscopy mandibular moves anteriorly forward but if there is a mandibular joint is not allowing to make the forward movement of mandible that leads to difficult laryngoscopy range of stylohyoid ligament suppose there is a calcification in stylohyoid ligament we are not able to make the forward movement or anterior movement of the hyoid leads to difficult laryngoscopy and space occupying lesion in the upper airway also leads to difficult laryngoscopy so this concept explains everything about the laryngoscopy why is becoming difficult so it's very clear that position does not allow provide the optimal laryngeal exposure we must apply force to achieve optimal exposure so so is 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 now clear that we need to apply force for a direct laryngoscopy so is possible to reduce the requirement of the force yes how so look at this this uh, has been explained in 2000 by dr greenland this is primary cow it's a oro pharyngeal laryngeal cow and secondary cow is laryngeal pharyngeal laryngeal tracheal cow fine so this is the primary cow and this is the line of sight so if you look at the area between the primary cow and line of sight is mainly a submandibular tissue and tongue so if you are able to reduce this area it decreases the force of requirement so what we are doing during the conventional laryngoscopy we are shifting this submandibular tissue mainly tongue above the line of sight to create a line of sight so now if you look at the area in a neutral position between primary cow and line of sight is this much of area if you change from neutral to extension because of stretching of the submandibular tissue the area reduces if you further change from extension to sniffing this further reduces and as per this publication the if you change the position from neutral to sniffing position there will be a 10% reduction in the submandibular tissue area so if there is a 10% reduction there is a less force is required so in sniffing position compared to neutral position and if you look at the direction of the tube or channel for the passage of the endotracheal tube in neutral is like this is angled but if you look at sniffing is straight so that is the reason we should use sniffing position for direct laryngoscopy one is decreases the submandibular tissue area decrease the force of uh, laryngoscopy and it provides the direct channel for the passage of the endotracheal tube compared to neutral position and that is the reason we should use sniffing position not other position and is uh, and that is the reason sniffing position this is the reason why sniffing position to be used for laryngoscopy not because it align the axis or do not align the axis that concept has been changed so what happens from neutral to extension this uh, so neutral to sniffing this primary cow become flattened and decreases the submandibular tissue area 
uh, between the line of sight and primary cow and that decreases the force of laryngoscopy. So snipping position provides the better laryngeal exposure with relatively less force of laryngoscopy compared to other position and facilitate the better pressure of the endotical tube. So in short, the success of laryngoscopy is summation of one positioning means posterior complex flexibility. Second, favorable anterior complex anatomy and compliance. And third is our ability to retract and compress the submandibular tissue. So if these three things placing at one time, then we'll be able to having an optimal laryngeal view. And many other factors affect the laryngeal view. That is external laryngeal manu manipulation. What is external laryngeal manipulation? So sub subconscious level, we are asking our assistant to press the uh, thyroid cartilage to get the view. That is called biomanual laryngoscopy. And there are a number of varieties of biomanual laryngoscopy. But modified biomanual laryngoscopy is more effective. In modified biomanual laryngoscopy, what we are doing, one person is doing the laryngoscopy, and that person, the performance is guiding the assistant hand to compress the thyroid cartilage. That's called modified biomanual laryngoscopy. And even <coughs> light, see, brighter light doesn't mean you'll get the optimal laryngeal view. You'll get the proper laryngeal view. So optimal light should be 700 lux in the any laryngoscope. And brighter laryngoscope may not be necessarily a better one. What should be the table height for the better laryngeal view? So this is absolutely wrong. Your umbilical, lower limb margin umbilical, your table height should be at the level of nipple or Xephyr process to get the better laryngeal view. Anyone, uh, Mako blade improves the laryngeal view with less force of laryngoscopy. Look at this. So from here onward, we are just bending the tip of the McCoy blade, which make the forward movement of the heart and open the larynx without with lesser force compared to other blade. So it makes the intubation faster, laryngoscopy faster and easier. And it significantly improves the laryngeal view. So in short, laryngoscopy is all about, it's a summation of proper positioning, favorable anterior complex anatomy, appropriate force of laryngoscopy. If required, we need to give a bimanual laryngeal manipulation. Your light source should be enough to provide the 700 lux, and your table height should be optimal as discussed. So I thank Dr. Greenland for providing this insight about the laryngoscopy. So do we have time, Dr. Johnson, so I can cover the understanding of video laryngoscopy? Sir, you can, you can cover. Okay. So this, these are the problems with the direct laryngoscopy. We need to create a direct line of sight. We need to apply force. We need to give an external laryngeal manipulation. We need to have a favorable anterior complex anatomy. And we need to have proper flexibility of the C-spine and O joint. So these are the problems with the direct laryngoscopy. So, video laryng to understand video laryngoscopy, we need to discuss the problems of the uh, uh, direct laryngoscopy and how to overcome this problem. So, if you look at the most of the guideline, 2020 ASA guideline, 2016 uh, ADA guideline, 2015 DAS guideline, all guidelines recommending the use of video laryngoscope. So, these questions now do not arise whether it's time to say goodbye or whether it's time to share flashlight. So now, video laryngoscope has proved itself. And if you look at this uh, recent uh, systematic Cochrane review of six years back, with 64 studies, inclusion of more than 7044 patients, and they stated that the conclusion was VL improves the view in predicted difficult intubation compared to dialect laryngoscope. VL improves the glottic view irrespective of predicted or known difficulty. It reduces the incidence of airway and laryngeal trauma. And most of all guidelines has discussed, suggested the use of video laryngoscopy as an initial approach. So video laryngoscopy has proved its ability. But important thing is that where we are lacking, 
which type of pseudolaryngoscopy we use hyperangulated angulated channel non channel macintosh type which position we should use sniffing neutral ramp and we don't have a definitive criteria to predict the difficult laryngoscopy what are the criteria there for predicting difficult laryngoscopy is there for laryngoscopy not for the predicting the difficult video laryngoscopy so we need to define that criteria so to understand that we need to understand what is video laryngoscopy and now this compact progress high resolution micro camera are available which is to be embedded on the tip of the scope which convert any scope into a video laryngoscope and many people using this they attaching that camera on the macintosh type of blade so will this solve the purpose of uh, overcoming the problems of the direct laryngoscopy let's discuss that so how video laryngoscope works so again three components of any scope first laryngeal exposure second getting into the larynx and third pressure of the endotracheal tube and this is where again uh, grillen and explain how video laryngoscope work we discuss about the primary cow and secondary cow if you look at the meeting line between the primary cow and secondary cow is in the laryngeal vestibule and this is relatively straight line and if you are placing the camera over the this line and its camera is facing towards the larynx you will get the laryngeal view sorry there is some and you will get the laryngeal view that's the basics behind the direct laryngoscopy and the, the basic behind the video laryngoscopy so you need to place a camera over this line to get the laryngeal that's the basic so indirectly we are shifting our eyesight into the pharynx to take the image of larynx so line of vision is only this much is a totally different from the line of vision we are creating with the direct laryngoscopy and as we are creating only this much line of vision in short it enables video laryngoscope enable us to look beyond the cow of tongue and that's the reason it provides a better laryngeal view by eliminating eliminating the need of oropharyngeal laryngeal axial alignment and tissue compression so now if you look at the different video video laryngoscope that there is a difference in the angle if you look at the atrack and king vision so its angle is like this so this angle of video laryngoscope atrack or pentax or king vision is matching with the primary cow that's why it's called anatomically curved blade and if you look at the cmac d blade or glidescope hyperangulated blade if you look at the angle of this video laryngoscope is matching with the primary cow of the oropharynx so again is anatomically curved blade but if you look at the macintosh type video laryngoscope when 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 it's in c2 the cow is like this so it's not matching with the primary cow of oropharynx is called macintosh type of blade is a non anatomically curved blade so if you want to classify the video laryngoscopy it can be classified as anatomically curved blade j shape in that it is j shape that is with the king vision atrack pentax and hyperangulated is a cmac d blade or glidescope hyperangulated blade and anatomically curved non anatomically curved blade is a macintosh type of blade so these are the difference between anatomically curved blade and anatomically non anatomically curved blade what does it make difference in a clinical practice we'll discuss in a later part of this session so if you look at a different video laryngoscope you are having more than 90 degree uh, angulation you are having 90 degree angulation what does it make difference to us higher the angle the camera is much near to the larynx lower the angle camera is a little bit away from the larynx look at this hyperangulated where camera is much near to the larynx and simple j shape angulation camera is a little bit away from the larynx what does it make difference to us whether it is near to the larynx or away from the larynx when camera is near to away from the, uh, near to larynx it provides almost near 90 to 100% focus query and when it is away from the larynx like in a king vision or pentax it provides the panoramic view so both is having advantage and disadvantage 
whether it's near or it is a little bit away from the larynx. So what's the position of camera and what's the clinical impact? It's having clinical impact on the laryngeal view, force of laryngoscopy and manipulation. We'll discuss it one by one. So if you look at the uh, King Vision or Airtrack or Pentax, the camera is positioned a little bit away from the larynx here, this red point. And it's looking straight. As it's looking straight, many times you get 50 to 60 percent focus, you will not get 80 to 100 percent focus scoring. And uh, epigrot is partially blocked the view in this case. So, to get the complete view, little bit of force is required. You need to lift the, this camera upward. So, many times with this type of laryngoscope, you need to make an upward movement of the upward lift of the laryngoscope to get the complete view. If you look at the angle, hyperangulated blade, the camera is positioned when it's in C2, either with glide scope or CMAG D blade, camera will position much nearer to, to the larynx, but it's on the meeting line between the primary cow and uh, secondary cow, and it's looking straight towards the larynx. So the difference between the Macintosh type of blade and hyperangulated blade. So in, in Macintosh uh, direct laryngoscopy, we are looking upside down. We are looking upside down. While in case of hyperangulated blade or angulated blade, we are looking downside up. That's the difference. As we are looking downside up, we are mo in most of the cases, epiglottis is not blocking the view and we get the good focus query compared to direct laryngoscopy. So that's the difference between direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy. And if you look at the using the Macintosh type video laryngoscope, camera is positioned here, it's looking upside down. Epiglottis can partially block the view. And still, if you are using Macintosh type of video laryngoscope, still you need to lift this tongue above this line. So Macintosh type of video laryngoscope do not decrease the force of laryngoscope. It do not enable us to look beyond the cough term. To look at the, this angle, uh, J, J shape uh, angulation with King Vision, it's very little bit difficult to insert the blade into the oropharynx. But if you use the hyperangulated blade, it's more difficult to insert the blade in the midline. But if you look, the Macintosh type video laryngos is easy to insert. So that is the one reason insertion is little bit tricky in video laryngoscope in midline compared to direct laryngoscope or Macintosh type of video laryngoscope that increases the time to incubate the patient with the video laryngoscope. I think we discussed this part, what is the classification. And we were lacking in the predicting the difficult, uh, difficult video laryngoscopy. This was the first publication who have defined the predictors for video laryngoscopy. And very interesting, according to this publication, sniffing position is an independent predictor for difficult video laryngoscopy. That means that if you are using anatomically curved blade, you should go for a neutral or ramp position. You should not use sniffing position because it's an independent predictor for difficult video laryngoscopy. So narrow mouth opening is again a difficult predictor for the video laryngoscopy. Now, see uh, what is viewing angle of video laryngoscopy and what's its clinical impact. So uh, our eyes is uh, its own perimetry and we can't look beyond that perimetry. Same way, each video laryngoscopic camera is own perimetry. That's called viewing angle of that camera, video laryngoscope. And there is this video uh, angle ranges from 55 to 90 degree viewing angle of camera. So if you look at the narrow angle camera, someone is doing narrow angle camera of 55 to 65 degree. Suppose this is this is an object and this is camera. What? So narrow angle camera will be able to see only this much yellow line area. But if you want to see whole area, you need to withdraw the camera a little bit backward to get the whole object in the screen. But if you are using wide wing angle camera, then you'll get, in spite of uh, near distance from the larynx, you'll get the complete laryngeal view. So this is narrow angle camera, this is wide angle camera. I think 
So this is the picture taken from the narrow angle camera. You won't see the adjacent structure near to the larynx. And this is narrow angle camera. If you are using the wide angle camera, you will see the adjacent structure. So if, when you are using the wide angle camera, you can maneuver the tip towards the larynx because tip is visualized much earlier compared to the narrow angle camera. So that's about the laryngeal exposure. Now we'll discuss about the entry into the larynx. So uh, with the direct laryngoscopy, we are creating a direct line of sight. But with video laryngoscopy, camera is here. We need to maneuver the tube along the oropharyngeal curve, along the primary curve, along the curve of the blade. That requires pre-shaping of the endotical tube. And we need to use the pre-stilated uh, pre endotical tube and pre-shaping as per the cow of oropharynx, as per the cow of laryngoscopic blade, is mandatory. So you need to pre-shape as per the cow of the laryngoscope. Or usually J-shape, hockey stiff pre-shaping is most of, in most of the video laryngoscopy is sufficient. Another problem with the video laryngoscopy, few video laryngoscopy is having screen on the top, few is having on the table. And you need to do an intubation and laryngoscopy in the oropharynx looking at the screen. And you need to frequently change your eyesight from screen to oropharynx, oropharynx to screen. That require hand-eye coordination. So because of two things, it requires pre-shaping and hand-eye coordination. It increases the time to intubation compared to direct laryngoscopy. So third part of video laryngoscopy intubation is the passage of the endotical tube. So we are not creating a direct channel for the pressure of an endotical tube with the video laryngoscopy. So endotical tube has to be moved as per the oropharyngeal laryngotracheal curve. So look at this. Suppose this is the video laryngoscopy in C2. And this is the trachea which travel downward. This causes disparity of angle between the video laryngoscopic blade and tracheal direction. And this causes difficult passage of the endotical tube. So you need to maneuver, to, you need to keep the stilated tube there. You need to withdraw the stilet and advance the tube. Then and then you'll be able to move the tube forward. And if you try to pass the, the uh, tube directly, it's going to hit the entire part of the larynx. So hyperangulated video laryngoscope require pre-shaping, hand-eye coordination, difficulty in making and taking is the time to have and difficult passage of the endotical tube. To overcome that, few companies have come out with the, uh, a slide slot on the laryngoscope. That's called channel video laryngoscope. And with channel video laryngoscope, it makes the line of vision and line of insertion one. And that decreases the time to intubation. And you do not require to use the stilet. So the time, is time to intubation is comparable with the direct laryngoscopy, with the channel video laryngoscope. So advantage of channel video laryngoscope over hyperangulated blade is line, it makes the line of vision and line of vision are one. Do not require stilet, require less time to intubate, and you can perform the awake intubation. This is one of the video of performing the awake intubation in post mandibular case for redo surgery. It's a nasotical intubation. We have used the non-channel video laryngoscope blade. Passing a tube to the nasopharynx. And asking the patient to open mouth, we have given the bilateral laryngeal superior laryngeal nerve block and transpicot spray. And look, I'm not giving any force. Able to see the vocal cord and epiglottis. So with hyperangulated blade, it's possible to intubate in a way. And even you can intubate in a neutral position also. You can use the video laryngoscope for checking the laryngeal uh, movement after thyroid surgery in a wake state with the spray. So what are the troubles we, we are getting during the channel video laryngoscope? Many times you are not getting the high pogo score, not able to negotiate the tube in the larynx. You'll get the laryngeal impediment. And in most of the time with the channel video laryngoscope, your tube is get lodged at the right laryng uh, right area of the fold. Even it's possible to get lodged at the left entire tube epiglottic impediment. So how to overcome this? Suppose your tube is getting lodged at the right area of the uh, epiglottic uh, 
fold. Look at this. My tube is getting lodged at the right area because it fold. So withdraw the tube, withdraw the scope a little bit, and move in the same direction towards right. That will align the tube trajectory with the uh, larynx, and then you can easily insert the tube inside. So this type of maneuvering is required to overcome the troubles. So what type of scope manipulation is required to overcome the trouble? Many times you need to withdraw the scope. Many times you have to rotate the scope. Many times you need to lift up the scope anteriorly, specifically channel video laryngoscope. And tube manipulation in form of withdrawing the tube and 90 degree counterclockwise rotation, most of the times overcome the right area pilotic impingement. So simple clinical pulse of video laryngoscopy. If you are master in Macintosh laryngoscope, direct laryngoscope, it doesn't mean that you are going to achieve same skill in video laryngoscope. It do not equate to the skill with a video laryngoscope. You need to learn the different video laryngoscopic technique, even if you are master in the direct laryngoscope. So another pro another is if you are master in one video laryngoscope, it does not equate to the skill with other video laryngoscope. You need to understand the other video laryngoscope. You need to understand the cow of other video laryngoscope, and you need to make the movement according to the cow of other video laryngoscope. Good video laryngoscopic view do not guarantee intubation. Boogie may not be the solution when there is a difficulty with video laryngoscope. Video laryngoscopy chosen must be selected according to this case. So if you are using for a difficult airway, then you should have anatomically cowed blade. If you are using for a routine case, then you should have both type of blade, angulated, uh, anatomically cowed, and Macintosh blade. Specifically, in predicted difficult airway, you should have anatomically cowed blade. In presence of blood, you should have Macintosh type of blade. So these are the lacuna in the video laryngoscopy. Like, what to do if we failed with the video laryngoscopy. What next? We don't have enough evidence. Should we go ahead with the other video laryngoscope or should we go ahead with the direct laryngoscope? We don't have a clear cut evidence based guideline for this question. How to define and predict a difficult video laryngoscopy? Till date, we are having only two or three publications on these directions. Situated based comparative performance of video, all video laryngoscope, we don't have. Still, we are lacking. What is ideal video laryngoscope? No one is able to define. Anyone I don't know. Thank you. Thank so, you. Clear and uh, extensive, easy to understand way of presentation. Rajesh, sir, you can proceed with the question. Thank you, sir. So in your experience, which uh, video laryngoscope you will advise? Can you hear me, sir? Beginner, sir. Hello, I didn't get you. So, yes. what, what are for you the, telling? Yeah, for uh, the beginners, which uh, video laryngoscope they can go for? Yeah, that's a very tricky question. Which video laryngoscope they, they should go for? The video laryngoscope in which they are having maximum expertise. They should purchase that one. Don't go for a newer one that they, they have not done the training. Or if you're purchasing some, get adequate optimal training before uh, going for a difficult cases. Start with the normal case first and then go for a difficult cases. And make it as a routine. If you're having a video laryngoscope, make it as a routine. So the type is not important. The training you get is more important. Type and training. Tra tra ideally, uh, so video laryngoscope is chosen as per the indications. So, if you want to handle the difficult airway cases, then you should have at least anatomically cowed blade. Macintosh blade is easy to learn and easy to use. But in case of difficult airway, you must have anatomically cowed blade. Rajesh, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we have some queries here, sir. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Ah, yes, sir. 
Yes. Uh, sir, the first doubt is like um, for conventional laryngoscopy, should we use uh, jelly based uh, gel, gel type uh, pillows or uh, routine pillows to uh, get See, that uh, sleeping position, yeah. which will so be the ideal? You can use any type of pillow, but you have to make it sure patient OC put should be at least 7 to 10 high, uh, centimeter higher than the level of table. That's very important. Oshi put should be at the 7 to 10 centimeter higher than the rest of the table. That is very important, rest of the body. Uh, sir, uh, uh, the, there's a question like, is there any uh, video laryngoscope which supports the oxygen supplementation through the scope itself? So, few companies have come out with the uh, uh, small oxygen cannula. I think 2U is one of that, is providing with the oxygen channel. But uh, looking at the coming uh, newer era, newer evidences, and newer uh, research, if you are using 15 liter per minute oxygen flow through the nasal cannula, it provides the apneic oxygenation. Then you don't need to supplement oxygen through the channel of the video laryngoscope. So use that. So we have made a protocol. In all, we in whatever the patient we are inducing is always with the 15 liter per minute oxygen is flowing through the nasal cannula. But it because it increases the non hypoxic apnea time. Sir, uh, regarding the positioning for uh, video laryngoscopy, uh, should the patient uh, head and should be at the level of the our ZP sternum or should the table be down uh, to for the easy introduction the of uh, important thing. Easy introduction, first thing, do not use sniffing position. It should be either extended or neutral position. Uh, sir, uh, for the tube insertion in video laryngoscope, uh, will that uh, external laryngeal maneuver help or should we only depend on the change in the uh, handling of video laryngoscope? Uh, see, it depends which type of blade you are using. If you are using hyperangulated blade, means you are looking downside up. You get uh, 80 to 60. Then you need to maneuver the scope rather than external laryngeal manipulation. External laryngeal manipulation is held specifically in Macintosh type of laryngoscope. Not with the angulated blade. I think uh, we have taken up almost all the questions here. Uh, Edward, sir, are we missing any questions, sir? No more questions, sir. Most of the time, they find they are easily able to visualize the vocal cord, but not able to get into it. Any yeah. tips you can give? See, see, there are few maneuvering, specifically those who are using a non channel hyperangulated blade. See, the, as there is a uh, disparity of angle between the video laryngoscopic blade and direction of the trachea. Disparity of angle. That creates the problem. So if you try to pass pilated tube, it's going to hit the entire part of trachea. So what you should do, take the tube up to the larynx, don't insert inside. Don't go into the larynx, don't go into the vocal cord. Withdraw the uh, stilet one to two centimeter. And keep the stilet there and then advance the tube. That decreases the chances of failure. And, uh, is, there any role for, uh, is there any role for Buji in uh, medial laryngoscopic intubation, sir? Hyperangulated uh, blade, angulated blade, there is no role of Buji. Because many Buji is a malleable and it cannot take the actual oropharyngeal or uh, shape or the shape as for the laryngoscopic blade. You find more difficulty. The CMAP, they have supplied a J-shaped stillet. Yes, J yes. Many companies are now supplying with the J-shaped stillet. Thank you so much, sir. Rajesh, sir, we can move to the second topic. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And we'll move on to the uh, next session, sir. And uh, the next session on is on um, it's a, it's a little bit of advanced uh, airway management. It's a uh, focused airway ultrasound in the an armamentarium in this uh, future era. Uh, the topic by uh, Dr. Amit 
Dixit, who is a consultant anesthetist from uh, Ruby Hall Clinic, uh, Pune. Uh, he is a uh, is a very known, uh, very well known faculty for all those who attend this AORA conferences regularly because uh, he is very much attached with that uh, AORA uh, conferences and the regional anesthesia fellowship of uh, AORA, and uh, he is a board member of uh, studies of Indian AORA India fellowship, and uh, he is also member of Perioperative Intensive Care uh, Echo and Ultrasound Foundation, and uh, he is conducting a lot of uh, workshops related to focus related to uh, regional anesthesia. And he had given a lot of publications also in that. And uh, during this uh, COVID era, his contribution with the focus of lung, ultra, uh, lung ultrasound helped excellently in many centers uh, to get excellent results. Thank you very much, sir, for that, uh, your contribution and uh, welcome, sir, for your topic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. And thank you, Dr. Edward, for giving me this wonderful topic uh, for presentation. Am I audible, sir? Is slide our slide is visible? Visible, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, this is uh, another interesting topic, uh, and I I was thinking why this uh, uh, title was chosen, and I could clearly see that this is uh, one of the wonderful article which has inspired many. The focused airway ultrasound and armamentarium in future airway management from emergency and critical care medicine in 2019. And uh, what are we knowing today with ultrasound and airway? Uh, I must admit that uh, it is ultrasounding is providing us phenomenal information, and uh, we still have to analyze we still have to uh, look at it as how we can apply. And uh, today morning after a lecture of Dr. Apex, sir, uh, he was talking about uh, the, the volume of, uh, you know, the submental space and uh, how, so all these uh, structures are seen with ultrasound. Now, all these studies are coming up and how we can utilize it to our clinical uh, decision making is another challenge. So today I'm just going to share what are the possibilities, what is our experience, where we are trying, where uh, what are the challenges and uh, there are no specific ready-made answers because this area is evolving and you have to find in your setup where you can utilize it for the betterment of your own patients. So why this airway is challenging is because airway is a dynamic uh, phenomenon. And uh, most of the ultrasound structures, when we do regional blocks or anything, they are most of the time static. In a way, we they don't change too much uh, every movement. And airway is one thing where we have CT plates and CT plate has limitations because airway can see with inspiration, expiration, what changes are happening in soft tissue. And therefore, it is still, uh, we are uh, analyzing all the information and trying to uh, create some uh, valid outcomes which can help us with changes. So these were some of the challenges. Uh, greetings to you all from my hospital. It's a 750-bedded multi-speciality hospital. We have regional anesthesia fellowship. And uh, Dr. Rajesh, sir, has, uh, I'm really grateful this COVID time has uh, helped us to grow in various areas and focus is one of those areas where uh, many departments have come together and started working together. Uh, it is like just uh, uh, instead of Atmanirbhar Bharat, it is like an Atmanirbhar physician or an Atmanirbhar anesthetist. We want to make our own bread and we do not wish to depend on a pulmonologist or a cardiologist or anybody else to tell us. So we are analyzing most of the time, radiology technicians were not available and we have to make all those decisions. So I think uh, ultrasound has proven its role beyond doubt. So is airway ultrasound a toy or a tool? Because this was the question asked to me several times. And I think uh, you will be able to answer this question uh, after my presentation. So uh, you, you can decide because though initially you may start it as a toy uh, eventually you will realize its importance when some of the lives are saved some complications are avoided and you can decide for yourself 
so disclosure nothing to disclose uh, photos and videos which i'll be showing are from my own volunteers and patients and um, i'll be showing some of the uh, ultrasound uh, videos also but we do have uh, different machines uh, so I'm not endorsing any specific machine, but yes, uh, any new machine is good machine and um, the machine which you are uh, into practice, you can utilize it to uh, with a better advantage. So outline of my talk, uh, I'll not be touching more on basics of ultrasound. Uh, I'll tell you what is the focus approach and how to handle airway and uh, topics related with airway ultrasound. So what is ultrasound imaging? Some of you might have seen my presentations previously on POCUS as well. And this is, uh, you always see something black and white and you don't know what is what. And what is ultrasound training is, uh, we see this, uh, some of us must have done the elementary and intermediate drawing exam where we have to see, write something, Mera Bharat Mahan, and you just draw some pattern. So this is Lee Day to France, something. Uh, nobody knows what is this, but uh, some of you can see a cyclist here. Yes, there is a cyclist. So this is uh, cycle racing across France. So the picture is self-explanatory. So this is pattern recognition. So ultrasound training, when we look at ultrasound, we see some pattern. And when we know that, yes, these are tracheal rings, string of pearls, this is cricoid cartilage. And somebody is telling us, and then we start recognizing this pattern. And then we rememorize this pattern and we try to correlate with our regular findings. So ultrasound training is basically pattern recognition. More you are exposed to different, different patterns and you memorize them and you try to see the ideal pattern and see the variation, you'll pick up so many things. So what is point of care approach? And this is one everyone must understand. We are not... Uh, assessing uh, uh, like a radiologist uh, just go and assess airway no, nothing like that we have a very specific question and that is called focus approach whenever the answer is binary in form of yes or no is this patient a case of pneumothorax yes or no is it endobronchial intubation yes or no is this size of tube enough for this patient yes or no uh, is intubation difficult? Yes or no. So all these, what is the tongue thickness? What is the, uh, you know, so all these are yes, no questions. We do not assess every time whole of airway for each and every patient. We have some specific question and we help each other uh, by identity. So unless you train yourself to ask a right question, that is a focus question, you will not get the right answer. So it should be a specific question. It is time sensitive. It is limited evaluation and it is refining the differential diagnosis and guiding my treatment. So whether it is pre-op, whether it is intra-op, uh, cricothyroid puncture, many, many uses we'll see now, uh, post-extubation strider. So very specific question, uh, you know, after thyroid surgery, are vocal cords moving or not? Yes or no, something like that. So I'm doing that specific uh, interrogation at that point of time to find answers. So what is the evidence of focus? Uh, I am a regional anesthetist. I have done my fellowship in regional anesthesia. And uh, there are many articles where, uh, you know, uh, anesthetists, uh, because anesth uh, who all are doing airway, uh, especially broadly, uh, you know, the intensive group, then we have cardiac anesthetist and a pediatric anesthetist and then all the general anesthetist. So this general anesthetist uh, in general or the physicians, the emergency physicians, they follow uh, many of the standard articles and one of them in ASRA, they have come up with these guidelines that if you do focus scanning for at least 30 patients uh, for airway, you are a level one provider. And I think this number is not very big. 30, you can easily become a level one provider and additional to 20 supervised. So uh, it's not a very, very difficult task. Uh, if you follow two or three conferences, workshops, uh, you even one week training is good enough training to uh, make you, you know, you will have good success with. Uh, so I have some, some PG students coming from different institute to my institute uh, and they were doing some thesis uh, and they got some skill set. So one and two hours of training also is enough.
to help them uh, with acquiring of good images and a little bit of practice they can improve in that so uh, it's a good good uh, news for all of us different probes so it depends on the which airway you are assessing uh, by and large we require a smaller footprint because of the airway and we use linear probe and as well as we use curvilinear probe curvilinear probe we use for tongue thickness and hyomental distance ratio for assessing neck mobility otherwise most of the time the work is done with a linear probe we need to know about where is the orientation marker the gain the depth i'm not going into that details ergonomics sometimes we have to assess airway in sitting position uh, we we have uh, we get numerous calls from icu for intubation for patients in strider we have to do awake fiber optic intubation in sitting position they cannot lie down so you can assess airway uh, in sitting position you can also assess airway in lying down position dr apex sir has already highlighted the importance of different positioning and uh, with a log roll neutral position and how we should achieve flexion at neck uh cervical and uh, extension at atlant occipital joint and everything uh, so by and large for ultrasound assessment we are uh, you will read in literature uh, people talk about neutral head position and hyper extended neck so extended and neutral these are the two position by which we are assessing the neck uh, probe orientation it can be uh, sagittal and transverse the most important thing is we need to understand anatomy first and what structures we are anticipating what structures we should anticipate so here the thyroid cartilage or uh, the purple one is like the the dhruva tara or something like a viru montanum for a you know urologist how they depend on that so adam's apple everyone can feel their own adam's apple and then there are structures above adam's apple and then there are structure below adam's apple so now from ultrasound point of view what what are the structures and uh, which are visible from uh, above the adam's apple and below the adam's apple so at the adam's apple if you look in the cross section of adam's apple the thyroid cartilage you see vocal cords so just exactly the cut section you will see so when we are talking of adam's apple it is at the vocal cord level then the structure above uh, 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 above the vocal cord so this green one you can I, i have to highlight here the the biggest one is the adam's apple which is green in color the purple here is the cricoid cartilage in between is the cricothyroid membrane these uh, are the are the tracheal rings lower down i think i'll use a pointer there may be some delay so i'll just use this pointer now now i think it's so this green one is the bigger one is the adam's apple and if you do a cross section you will see vocal cords uh just uh, uh in the cross section area below that uh, you have this yellow one is the cricothyroid membrane then we have a cricoid cartilage and below are the tracheal rings now so the structures above the vocal cord i am going to see epiglottis yes uh, and there are uh, then uh, we have hyoid bone then we have tongue and we will be seeing hyomental distance ratio and other things now below the vocal cords i have this cricothyroid membrane then we have this cricoid cartilage and i am going to see uh, the tracheal rings and the esophagus so the cross sectional anatomy we need to know now when we talk about difficult airway we are talking about the soft tissues the presence of soft tissues on the anterior neck surface so you will see all those uh, calculations like skin to epiglottis skin to vocal cord skin to hyoid bone skin to stomach so all these are basically trying to gauge how much is the posi- how much is the soft tissue on the anterior neck surface and it can be seen in neutral position as well as in hyper extended neck position so is there any displacement as with positioning of the patient uh, so these are the parameters which will be assessing so again uh, the hyoid bone on the top the tongue the hyoid bone then we have a ep- epiglottis then at the level of thyroid cartilage we have the vocal cords then the cricoid cartilage in between the cricothyroid membrane 
and below are the tracheal rings, the thyroid, the isthmus, and other things. All right. So we'll move uh, with ultrasound and intubation first. So what are the advantages uh, at the time of intubation? Now, this is the position of uh, uh, where you can park your probe, uh, usually at the level of C7 vertebra lower down, where in one go you see trachea as well as we you see esophagus. So when both are seen in one view, uh, it gives me peace of mind because most of the time when my PGs and fellows are intubating, uh, I really want to know where the tube has gone. Most of the time, the junior most PG will almost go in meditation and he will be like uh, nothing to see, speak. And we are so worried what is happening, what, where is the tube and they, do, they will not tell anything. So it, it really actually increases the anxiety. I am sure those who are using video laryngoscope and other teaching tools and if that's the practice, everyone is quite relaxed. But I think with ultrasound, if you have a probe there, uh, it will definitely guide you where the tube is going. So even in pediatric patients, when people are not sure about what should be the diameter, what, what should be the tracheal uh, diameter, which size tube we should use. So here in the subglottic area, we can definitely assess the diameter and it tells us about the external diameter. So all these ET tubes, six, seven, eight, nine, these are all the internal diameters. The external diameter is printed on the ET tube. So nine number uh, ET tube will have an external diameter of around 1.25 or something. So you just have to see the diameter and choose what size tube you can have. And uh, accordingly, so most of the time pediatric patients uh, do struggle. We do struggle with number of tubes and that should, at least it will give us a fair idea uh, what should be uh, the tube we should be selecting. So when we see trachea and when we see esophagus, uh, it is it is just difficult to miss the esophagus. We can ask the patient to deglute beforehand and we know where the, uh, the, the probe to be parked. And uh, this has happened to me, uh, you know, two weeks back when I was just parking my probe there and seeing what is happening. And already the uh, I was with another consultant that time. And so we had a discussion that this could be difficult intubation. Uh, there was a little retrogneth here. And so he first just passed the bougie and it was a routine laryngoscopy. And as he has passed the bougie, I could clearly see that bougie has gone in the esophagus. And I could warn him, see the, uh, the bougie is already in the esophagus. There is no point, uh, you know, passing the tube over it and then checking it. So before uh, any ETCO2 reading or before any ventilation, I could clearly see that we have missed the trachea, the bougie and the movement is clearly seen in the esophagus. And this has happened for three times. And for all those three times, I have just warned him, withdraw it, you have missed it. And then we did some external laryngeal manipulation and then somehow a uh, little bit of change of uh, uh, flexitip and, uh, you know, we were able to pass the bougie. And then I told him that, yes, this time the bougie is not there in the esophagus. And I could feel, uh, you know, the bougie in the trachea as well. And then the tube was passed and we could see those uh, tracheal signs. And uh, we, we clearly appreciate the movement in the trachea as well. And uh, we could say that has given us a good confidence that how uh, it can be utilized for all these patients and uh, we could have uh, wasted a lot of time and sometimes in laparoscopic surgery when we pass the tube in esophagus and put a lot of air, the surgeons are unhappy at the time of laparoscopic cholecystectomy or because uh, after later uh, we pass the Ryle's tube, it may not def get deflated that much. So it's better to avoid, uh, you know, in the first go. And there are now ACLS guidelines that uh, you can park the probe here and after after COVID, nobody wants to actually ventilate and get that, you know, six trace of ETCO to confirm to confirm the tube. So uh, it's very good idea that uh, before uh, getting uh, or starting any umbuing or attaching ventilation, we are very well aware that where the tube has gone. So if it has gone in esophagus, I am sure if you have seen once only, you will realize that you just cannot miss uh, ET tube in esophagus. You can clearly see the Ryle's tube also. Sometimes Ryle's tube uh, is also a big challenge in 
onco surgery theaters where the tube has gone where the uh, where the rail tube rail tube has gone and just by placing the probe we are very confident yes it is correctly in position and you can utilize it for uh, you know feeding through rail tube that's a big challenge so uh, confirmation is a good idea so i'm just showing you this uh, video i think uh, this i'll play this video so click on the images click on the image no? I just pen. Okay. I have used a laser pointer, but I have to stop that laser pointer. I think I just hmm. yeah, sorry. So uh, uh that's the trachea. You can see the trachea there, and on one side is nicely seen esophagus so most of us think that esophagus is exactly posterior to trachea but here it is posterior lateral uh, and there are papers if you look at the anatomy where the uh, uh, the esophageal position you can see the esophagus nobody can miss the esophagus round and you can ask the diglu so there is this uh, even the tracheoesophageal groove there is a recurrent laryngeal nerve so we always talk about uh, regional anesthesia and intraskeletal block and laryngeal uh, involvement if too much of drug if drug sits here so that's the importance of this area for uh, uh, for an anesthetist so when we see this esophagus uh, very well there is another question where we should be providing the cricoid pressure so i think uh, this has changed the way we look and uh, once we park the probe we see the esophagus and then we may just push the esophagus and try to occlude it at the time of you know um, rapid sequence induction so this is another insight uh, and if you know where is the anatomy and without uh, you know just doing it blindly it's good idea to utilize this opportunity another important uh, thing is whether the tube has gone endobronchially so we can inflate the cuff with saline which is uh, seen as a hypoechoic structure and if the cuff has gone beyond the third uh, tracheal ring uh, you can you can very well say that it has become endobronchial or something and this is useful in pediatric population when we are really scared uh, we do not want so we always keep that pediatric stethoscope and everything so it's it's a real time thing to just place a probe and see uh, uh, the airway examination is not complete unless you see and put it over the second and third intercostal space to see pleural sliding and it has now become a stethoscope for uh, all the uh, physicians uh, who are dealing with airway anesthetist and emergency physician and uh, the visceral and the parietal pleura they ride over each other and it produces a shimmering effect and which is seen very well but if it is not visible uh, then you may uh, put an m mode m mode is the motion mode which picks up motion at the line of interrogation and because of the motion the distal area is seen granular it is like a seashore and deep inside is a, a calm sea where there is no movement now this is useful when we are doing with dlt though the gold standard for dlt is definitely pediatric fiber optic intubation uh, the use of pediatric pedi uh, fiber optic scope for seeing the blue curve and everything but uh, this technique uh, there was this paper from tata memorial hospital mumbai and dr jigi divati and group where they have proved that it is better than auscultation so uh, uh, ultrasound is superior to auscultatory methods and you can see whether it has become endobronchial or not uh, just by placing the probe and in pediatric population there is another advantage where uh, you can uh, because the sternum is not calcified so you can even see the movement of diaphragm uh, very well so just uh, nowadays most of the machines with click button you can change the probe and see whether it is moving or not and you can confirm so this is about intubation so i have spoken about intubation how to choose the size of the tube uh, by looking at the tracheal diameter uh, in the subglottic area i have said uh, how to detect endobronchial intubation uh, and in long axis view 
and uh, we we have also seen the importance of esophagus whether the tube has and where to park the probe so uh, the parking of the probe uh, where it should be and this is uh, in pediatric patients and anywhere where you can see esophagus and trachea together so this is uh, uh, so somebody was asking me you have you need to have a machine so i said yes uh, if you have a machine and you are another assistant in the ot it's good idea that you to get uh, arrange all the ergonomics and place the probe there we come upon this smaller part before going over to other aspects of difficult intubation because extubation is ultrasound helping me so uh, dr apex sir was talking today morning about the vocal cord movement uh, and spraying it on and a post thyroid surgery so uh, vocal cords we see very well the true vocal cords are seen as black line and the false vocal cord are gray and then then there is a arytenoid cartilage so simultaneous movement of arytenoid cartilage uh, rules out vocal cord palsy so these are some of the videos uh, i'll try to show these videos where the vocal cords are moving uh, i have uh, uh youtube channel with uh, all these videos and some of them are even uh, scanning videos uh, even better you can visit that and see so this is uh, the uh, another video here you can see the vocal cord movement the the the, the hypoechoic black area i am asking the patient to say e and you can see the vigorous vocal cord movement in the middle and another the final th video just to show you how the movement can be the same e and you can see the vocal cord movement so far so this was uh, just to re emphasize you can see the black uh, as true vocal cord and the gray as false vocal cord and lower down are the arytenoids which are moving simultaneously ruling out Uh, uh the vocal cord palsy so in thyroid surgery it is good idea to use bailey's maneuver some of you uh, may be knowing bailey's maneuver where et tube is removed and we just place lma and then after placing the lma uh, uh you, we can see the movement of vocal cords very well uh, most of the time after the thyroid surgery when surgeons are asking most of us do laryngoscopy and i find it very barbaric uh, 90% of the time nobody sees anything and everybody says yeah sab theek hai everything is fine and we just move on and this is a ritual uh, more than a scientific thing uh, so i think we can be more scientific and objective and we can store these images and we can see, show it to our relatives and uh, surgeon also uh, so uh, after bellies maneuver you can pick this up very well so uh, post extubation strider is uh, another uh, important area some of us do have icu or hdu or you know uh, post surgical uh, we extubate second day so uh, there are different ways by which we can look at the trachea and uh, one one of them is this paper uh, recently from 2023 where uh, it has looked at the laryngeal air column width difference in predicting the risk of post extubation strider Now, this is a very upcoming area you need little uh, you know fine tuning with measurements and little advanced machines uh, two three ways i i'll give you some idea about how people look at it uh, one is people look at the tracheal diameter and if you have say tracheo malacia or scabbard trachea it is like conducting a leak test with ultrasound so if there is lot of tracheo malacia the the uh, when the cuff is inflated and the cuff is deflated there is lot much uh, difference uh, in the tracheal diameter because tracheal diameter is flabby the trachea is flabby in tracheal malacia so that uh, we can expect post extubation strider whereas when the trachea is quite sturdy and there is not much of change with inflation and deflation of et tube then you can say that uh, the leak test is uh, that is how we are conducting it another way is looking at the air column uh, and uh, when the cuff is inflated it appears more of a, a, a rectangular in shape when it is deflated it is trapezoid in shape and we measure the width and any width more than 16 mm it means lot of uh, inflation deflation changes are happening it could be uh, we can expect post extubation strider of course this is a really fine area more practiced by intense 
expensive is when they have to take decision about uh, uh, this area. We can utilize it for our patients uh, who require ventilation for more than 24 hours, especially the oncosurgical patients. Cricothyrotomy uh, or front of neck uh, access is very, very crucial. And again, we have to remember the anatomy, the thyroid cartilage, which creates a hypoechoic uh, uh, sort of a ultrasound picture. Then we have a cricothyroid membrane and then the purple one is the cricoid cartilage. So uh, what should be the position? It is. Uh, it can be done in a transverse scan, which is a TACA method or in a or in a, a parasagittal scan uh, using sting of pearls method. So I'll be showing you one which is easy to correlate. So uh, one is the thyroid cartilage, which is creating a black uh, hypoechoic area. Two is the uh, cricoid cartilage. So, and uh, three is the tracheal ring here. You have string of pearls appearance. So whenever you have string of pearls, the tracheal rings, and suddenly you see this step from two to three, uh, downward slope, uh, that's a hallmark for cricoid cartilage. So that is how we should be identifying the cricoid cartilage. We must know where is the orientation marker of our linear probe. Here, the one on this side is the cranial word and below is the cordard. So when we identify the structure as uh, the cricoid cartilage, then we have to see this white line. This is air mucosal interface. Whenever we have an air mucosal interface, uh, it creates a white line. So any structure above a white small thin lining is the cricothyroid membrane. So if we see this white line between one and two, you have to bring the structure in the middle of the screen, use M mode as a marker. Just if you press the M mode button once, it will, it will divide the whole screen into two. So uh, we just have to uh, bring the structure in the middle of the screen and try to mark it with the marker pen, or we can just place and move the probe, cordard and cephalad and try to place the needle. Needle is seen again, uh, it creates a metallic artifact and we can see the middle of the uh, screen and we can easily mark this area as the cricothyroid membrane. So this is how we do marking. Now, one uh, ex uh, what we have learned from experience is when we are called for uh, cricothyroid uh, membrane, how we are utilizing it. So, patients with difficult intubation, say in ICU, when we had this uh, issue uh, about uh, patients with strider in sitting position, we have done intubation in sitting position. So, we have prophylactically placed uh, a 16 gauge cannula there. We have punctured the cricothyroid membrane with the ultrasound. And then we have attached a 2 cc syringe. And uh, then you, as we know, the 6.5 uh, universal connector and umbuing. And as we have punctured and placed a 16 gauge cannula there and removed the stillet, we have even uh, done some amount of spraying with 2% lignocaine and uh, some topicalization. So uh, as we are able to attach umbu uh, to that and do some oxygen, oxygenation. It has provided us a little additional 10-20 seconds uh, to complete our uh, awake fiber optic intubation drill in sitting position. So uh, this is uh, one school of thought and this has been uh, promoted, advocated and popularized by Dr. Pankaj Kundra and team where uh, the question is uh, for a critically ill patients or a high risk patients, we do put radial artery cannula and at the end of surgery, we we just remove that cannula and the patients are safe. Uh, so in a difficult airway, why not to not only mark, but go one step ahead and just puncture it and place the cannula because in emergency, whenever there is trauma, it is very, very difficult to uh, get any cannula. And then it can be a marker if in emergency, if somebody needs a surgical tracheostomy, it can help the ENT surgeon also because sometimes the neck is too difficult, a big thyroid, a fixed mass, you know, a static neck, um, patient in strider, in sitting position, uh, uh, we just hardly get a one best chance to perform. So this is one school of thought. Uh, I, I would like to know the, uh, you know, in the end, uh, if Apex serves, he wants to contribute in this area, but this is, uh, we have practiced and it has uh, helped us because uh, it is very difficult uh, to conduct these intubation drill in sitting position and some oxygenation. Uh, 
we also have to maintain that 16 gauge cannula in in a straighter position sometimes the patient tends to cough and a lot of secretions do come through the cannula so it is difficult to oxygenate but uh, in that case a uh, little bit of spraying has helped and we could still maintain some amount of oxygenation before going ahead with the drill so we can utilize this uh, uh, marking of uh, you know the cricothyroid membrane or prophylactically puncturing it uh, before proceeding with a drill most of us do topicalize the airway just we do a one puncture why not do a puncture with a 18 or a 16 gauge cannula so this is one uh, thought to ponder uh, and you can decide if it, it can be applicable in your case now coming to the last area which is difficult airway and i am i am coming to this area last because uh, many of uh, the uh, the people who are using ultrasound they say that this area is still emerging and there are no clear cut guidelines to say do this and do not do this or something like that so uh, i am just letting you know a few concepts here and what are the what is the literature review and how we can apply it we have done uh, uh, research in our department with this we have used few parameters and uh, it has helped us and uh, it is it is providing us an opportunity to look at the airway now this was uh, uh, whenever there is difficult airway uh, i know the airway experts dr apex sir is there in general uh, how we look at airway is one it could be challenge in mask ventilation so is ultrasound going to help me with mask ventilation so uh, we have latest article which was published last month it says that uh, difficult mask ventilation hardly two or three papers are there and we need more studies but still looking at the hired bone we can predict a difficult mask ventilation so skin to hired bone distance little bit it can give us some glimpse then difficult laryngoscopy yes uh, tongue thickness tongue volume <clears throat> and there are parameters to help us with predicting difficult laryngoscopy third is difficult intubation so all those anterior soft tissue uh, structures and skin uh, to vocal cords skin to epiglottis skin to isthmus skin to hard bone they all are telling us uh, then the pre epiglottic space now people have even looked at uh, the glottic to epiglottic angle and other things so it is uh, it, it is giving us a lot of information so conventional method so none of the article has said that we have to stop conventional method so it is not a replacement for our conventional assessment method but yes it is a very good adjunct if you combine ultrasound information with your conventional skills it is going to be uh, it it has shown to increase sensitivity and specificity for success rate of uh, difficult intubation so there are several articles uh, on conventional and compared and they found that ultrasound is beneficial uh, they have looked at the anterior soft tissue and tongue thickness to predict difficult intubation now this was the article which was published uh, just uh, a week two uh, weeks back and this is a systematic review uh, for preoperative ultrasound for predicting difficult airway and it has uh, predominantly looked at all the previous studies and uh in uh, in neutral position and in extended neck position so skin to epiglottis uh, mid epiglottis distance was one and then skin to anterior commissure the tongue thickness uh, and the hyomental distance ratio uh, inflection and extension and even it has talked about eg angle so at least three parameters uh, which are uh, if we use one is uh, uh, skin to uh, mid epiglottis second uh, could be the tongue thickness third could be the hyomental distance ratio uh, at least 3 or 4 you it, it will give you some fair idea uh, and i think what ultrasound has done is we have started anticipating airway in a better fashion and therefore calling for help getting all gadgets in place making uh, a backup plan and it has uh, reduced the anxiety with us uh, because most of the time it is a lot of adrenaline when it is difficult airway so uh, till this stage uh, i think ultrasound has caused some dent in reducing the anxiety uh, and anticipation uh, uh, skill set uh, is considered so we have looked at various studies and what are uh, we talking when it comes to difficult mask ventilation so distance from skin to hyoid if it is more than 1.4 it predicts uh, 
i'll be showing you the literature review as well so it is uh, it is prediction of difficult mass ventilation but the latest article tells that more and further detailing and studies are required in this regard difficult laryngoscopy the tongue volume the tongue thickness most of us practice tongue thickness tongue volume is another uh, skill set where uh, uh, diff, uh, the articles have to a consensus something around 6 5.8 to 6 when the thickness is uh, more than that then it is difficult laryngoscopy because tongue is coming in the way and it is difficult to squeeze it and move aside and, and when it comes to intubation then we have all the parameters to look at the anterior soft tissue how much is the thickness so skin to hard bone skin to epiglottis in neutral as well as in hyperextended neck so once the neck is extended probably it reduces some amount of soft tissue there then skin to anterior commissure to vocal cord then thyroid isthmus then they have looked at uh, high mental distance ratio in neutral and extended position sometimes patients are in lying down position and it is difficult to make them sit so this type of a parameter can help you to assess neck mobility uh, uh, you know, whether it is uh, neck is mobile or not looking at this ratio then there is this pre uh, the peri epiglottic space people have looked at the space very very uh, uh, too much i mean uh, they have involved a radiologist to look at it and even there are papers from radiology side as well to help them uh, assess this soft tissue area so i'll i'll be talking on that and then uh, recently the glottic to uh, epiglottic to glottic ratio so uh, yes uh, are, i'll be demonstrating uh, some of the tips i have used uh, uh, these parameters so which parameters i have used i can tell you what are the challenges so skin to hired bone now there are uh, uh, papers in obstetric anesthesia and what simple parameter they have said is whether we can see hired bone or not so if hired bone is seen it is probably easy intubation and if hired bone is not seen it is probably difficult intubation and even this simple criteria has worked well with good specificity and sensitivity so uh, in obese patients it is sometimes very difficult to visualize hired bone or in patients with uh, preeclampsia eclampsia and all those uh, so presence of hired bone is one of the important criteria any value more than 1.4 is difficult mask ventilation also this higher mental distance ratio we do it uh, with neutral position and extended neck position so how the image will uh, so any higher mental distance ratio less than uh, uh, so extension divided by neutral position so ratio should not be near one it should be you know, more than one so it means it has some flexibility so what are the images so this is in neutral position and then uh, extended neck position so we see the higher mental ratio so in extended neck it is around like 4.3 or something and it is 3.3 uh, uh, in uh, you know a neutral position and we calculate the ratio so definitely 4.3 divided by 3.3 ratio is more than one it means neck is quite flexible when the ratio is almost one or less one less than 1.1 it means neck is hardly mobile and uh, we, we we have difficulty uh, probably achieving good laryngoscopic vision so skin to epiglottis uh, people are talking about mid epiglottis whether where to assess at the apex at the mid and or at the base and uh, different articles do not say anything about it as where they have uh, assessed and most of the studies they just have come up with a cutoff point of around 2 1.9 to 2 and uh, this is the black hypoechoic area so instead of cursor up till here probably the air mucosal interface is white line and people say that we should be calculating from the base like to write down there and uh, now the most of the articles are coming up they say mid uh, esophageal so uh, even some of them instead of using a transverse scan people are using a parasagittal scan so more and more information so uh, till date uh, most of the studies have used this black hypoechoic thing as epiglottis and they have measured skin to epiglottis distance from its top to the skin and whenever the value is more than 1.9 we have used it in our study as well and it, it fairly correlates uh, with our uh, our patients uh, actually one of the important fact is uh, we do not have a normalcy data with uh, you know in 
Indians of population, probably I may be, uh, as far as I know, um, Apexar may be telling us more about, but uh, we are mainly dependent on, uh, as the ultrasound in this area is emerging, we have to depend on whatever ethnic, whatever, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Western population data, uh, sometimes we have to depend on. Uh, as we can see, uh, the size of ET tube uh, in our nation versus those uh, who are from uh, America or UK and how this. So these, these uh, 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 so do not be very rigid about a number because different studies will have different. So you need to think of a range for all these studies and you have to look where, which parameters they have looked at. So this area above the epiglottis is the is the uh, is the uh, I was talking about the pre-epiglottic space. So people have looked at this pre-epiglottic space, and uh, when the whole of the area is more than five centimeters square, when this whole area is more than five centimeters square, uh, uh, there uh, or a value of when the thickness is just measured, it is more than two point five. It is Cormac Leon two B. So uh, this is uh, even people have drawn a midline and divided into two, 10 on this side, 10 on this side, uh, it, it, is, it is also uh, reducing. So only two, three slides, some more slides, almost it is done. Uh, I think uh, uh, so this, this area again, is, people have looked at it. Sometimes uh, uh, the ratio when, when we are talking about uh, the vocal cord to pre-epiglottic space ratio, uh, you may need to place the probe in the cricothyroid area and just slant it upward and me measure the distance and carry out the ratio. Uh, it's a challenging task, but at least two, three parameters like skin to uh, epiglottis, the, then the, what I have showed is the, uh, the hyomental distance ratio and we'll see the tongue thickness as well. So uh, tongue thickness uh, is uh, usually using a curvilinear probe. You can do it in long axis or short axis. And this is how the tongue will appear. And uh, in the neutral position, you can do it at the base of the tongue. In the, uh, the tongue should be, the neutral position of the tongue is it should be just above the upper incisors uh, in the normal. It should not be withdrawn. So we do this uh, and look at, so it gives us a fair idea what should be the challenge with laryngoscopy. Or suppose you have done a surgery where there could be tongue edema. So post-op, uh, uh, especially with cleft lip palate or something, uh, this is just a thought where all those indications where tongue size may be more, you can predict it where, whether the laryngoscopy is good enough to displace the tongue. Now you can see another parameter which has recently been discussed and this is the TP space, the palatoglossal space. So in this view, we see the palate and uh, between the tongue and uh, palate, there is a space. So uh, there is no such parameter as of now uh, when we are uh, um, assessing the airway with a conventional method, we ask for MPC score, we ask the person to put out the tongue. So when they put out the tongue, we see the uh, the posterior pharyngeal wall, the MPC grading, but uh, it cannot be extrapolated to when we are doing uh, mask ventilation. So this is the position of tongue in neutral position. Uh, uh, I mean, the tongue is inside the mouth and uh, uh, the mouth is closed and there is a space between the palate and the tongue. So it is telling me that probably I'll be able to ventilate this patient uh, uh, with back and mask very well because there is a space. If there is no such space, uh, then probably we need uh, airway gadgets, uh, probably oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway because tongue is going to fall. So in a, uh, this is a very useful uh, parameter of palatoglossal space and it has almost 91% sensitivity. Uh, if you, even if you answer the question as yes or no, if it is yes, then 91% sensitivity is there that you will be able to mass ventilate this patient. So what are the sensitivity specificity measurements? This was another article in 2020 and I was just re-emphasizing this point that all these ultrasound parameters should be used in combination with Malampatti, with thyro, uh, uh, with all the regular parameters where uh, and when we have combined this, 
then the specificity and sensitivity increases to around near around 90 percentage so you can see here 93 and uh, 86 when they have combined uh, skin to anterior commissure distance uh, with pre, uh, with periapiglottic space to epiglottis and vocal cord ratio and hyomental distance ratio the malampatti and uh, tmd so thyromental distance so combination strategy works very well Percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy, I would not like to overemphasize, but this has happened uh, when one patient of uh, operated neck dissection was taken for tracheostomy. And we just placed the probe and we could show a lot many vessels there. So instead of a horizontal slit, the surgeon has modified his decision to make a vertical slit. And uh, this is for surgical tracheostomy. And even with percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy, you can see which tracheal ring and whether there are any vessels there by putting a color Doppler, uh, whether the thymus, sometimes the thyroid MR artery, which is a direct branch from aorta, uh, can be there and we should avoid uh, because it can bleed to death. So all these vessels before planning with any incision or uh, any dissection in that area should be done very well. So you can see, put a color Doppler and identify these vessels. So vocal cord pathology, is another uh, aspect and uh, sometimes uh, you know the musicians we have operated stars singers and it is good idea to just do a prophylactic scan sometimes you may see a cyst or a polyp or a nodule and you can predict because we have to take that consent and we have to predict whether uh, voice quality will change or not so a quick scan preoperative scan is a good idea to predict all these, uh, uh, it is good to use a, a you know supraglottic device, but some surgeries do require intubation, and we can tell them with a lot of confidence that apparently, as of now, vocal cords are fine. Because this uh, in one patient, we have seen one polyp and it was incidental finding, but it could happen that at the time of passing of tube, the, the cyst may break. So LMA positioning is another uh, important aspect and if you have a probe just in the same position where you have placed it for ET tube, you can see whether it is getting dislodged. Uh, you, so, I mean, you need to have a focus question and you, you try to find answers. So, we, we are not having any specific answer. If you have some specific question, correlate with the anatomy, try to see ultrasound anatomy and try to, you know, adjust. So, some people have you know, looked at the anatomy and they have changed the position of LMA so that it suits well. So this can be an additional step. Uh, maxillary sinusitis is another aspect where we were worried about COVID times uh, when there was a lot of mucus. So if there is an air fluid level in the, mu uh, in the maxillary sinus, it was a relative contraindication for nasal intubation uh, because uh, uh, all those fungus may go posterior words. So, uh, we used to look at that time. Find this uh, almost completes the airway assessment. Uh, I would just like to highlight uh, one important point that airway examination is not complete unless we look at the gastric ultrasound. Though this is not my topic to cover today. But aspiration uh, risk, unless we rule out, it is like a lower airway assessment. So we have to see the gastric pyloric antrum. And I think if you are interested, you do a focus workshop with us. We'll teach you how to identify liquid and solid content. And any volume more than 1.5 ml per kg for liquid is risk of aspiration. Any presence of any solid content is also risk of aspiration. We have done this. And when we have started doing this, our obstetrician and our surgeons accepted it because we could show them that it is a high risk and uh, uh, they would say otherwise say uh, char ghanta ho gaya, four hours I've done and why not so now they can clearly see the content and we could convince them that it is a solid content let us wait and they have accepted us so there are good charts available it can tell you the cross sectional area the volume and it's a very very easy step our PGs are doing this chart is being uh, we have uh, attached it to all our ultrasound machine for ready reference and so in summary, uh, what has ultrasound changed is uh, difficult airway. Yes, it is still emerging. We are looking at the anterior soft tissue neck uh, structures, the head, the epiglottis, the tongue. Uh, critical situations, definitely the cricothyroidomy, the percutaneous dilatational tracheostomy, 
uh, even the vocal cord movement after surgery, the post extubation strider, these are real time and they are helping in a very, very big way. Uh, gastric content aspiration is integral part of airway management. Real time placement of ET tube, DLT, LMA is better confirmed with ultrasound and especially you are in teaching institute and there is a large supportive evidence in favor of ultrasound. So thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation and easy way of explaining the ultrasound of nerve. Over to you, dear professor. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, sir. Very excellent presentation it is. Uh, we have some queries, sir. Um, is this predictions of uh, difficult airway uh, is validated in pediatric uh, age group also with ultrasound? Yeah, so uh, uh, there are uh, papers with pediatric, but pediatric uh, assessments are most of the time they talk about anthropometric measurement for a given subset of patient. I mean, uh, what are the calculations for a five-year-old child rating for a nine-year-old child? So uh, uh, these are the papers when they talk about because there are papers with... Uh, uh, the diaphragmatic um, predominantly with uh, as they talk about extubation. So pediatric cardiac anesthesia pa mini papers are there when they talk about the post extubation strider and ex um, predominantly the diaphragm and uh, other areas. So pediatric airway again is a evolving challenge. So uh, what I am trying to suggest here is uh, validated studies are coming up, but we do not have that much of data, though I showed you the 23rd uh, 2023 latest article, which has done a meta-analysis, and at least they have come up with at least two, three parameters in adult subset of population. So uh, it's emerging, uh, but as you can understand with uh, pediatric, there are challenges. But I would uh, urge uh, my practice is a mixed practice. I am not exclusively a pediatric anesthetist, but what has helped me in pediatric population is airway is seen even better with pediatric population. So if you have a child of eight or nine years, it is a good idea to assess and see all the structures. Structures are very well seen. Uh, so it's it's it will take some more time to analyze questions. People have started utilizing it to see the uh, gauge of the ET tube uh, to confirm whether endobronchial intubation or not. So all those basic principles uh, whether ET tube has gone in esophagus or uh, you know uh, whether it has gone in the trachea. So these simple basic uh, principles of airway are definitely being followed in pediatrics. But specific pediatric related uh, uh, studies are still emerging to reach to a level where they have uh, standard guidelines or validated outcomes. So some papers I have read, but I am sure uh, Apex sir and still there are many other uh, delegates also. They may uh, uh, be knowing few more things, but uh, to my knowledge, it is still emerging. Hopefully, I have answered. Uh, sir, is there any uh, way of identifying the submandibular space assessment with the uh, ultrasound? Exclusively submandibular space. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the thio, the 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 palatoglossal space, which I have showed with the, for the tongue thickness. Uh, there uh, you can actually place it in the submandibular area only and you can see the palatoglossal space very well in a better way uh, by placing in the submandibular area and uh, you see if there is any space when the tongue is in neutral position is there any space between palate and tongue and whether uh, we can uh, we can talk about uh, uh, ventilation mask mask ventilation so this is useful Sometimes some patients are obese and we just place the probe in the submental uh, area and we 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 uh, tend to see and there is a good palatoglossal space. So we should not be uh, over worried that just because patient is obese, we will not be able to do proper mass ventilation and we will struggle with ventilation. So in that case, I would probably choose uh, uh, non-depolarizing muscle relaxation. When I don't see any space, probably my choice would be a rapid sequence induction and I keep one person ready, uh, probably with uh, more advancement of gadgets and probably uh, I'm anticipating a difficult ventilation. So good pre-oxygenation, probably uh, all those. Now, this is another topic. Uh, now we have even 
uh, facilities with uh, apneic ventilation we can do uh, achieve very good uh, pre oxygenation so it help we have some advantage so all these gears will change if we are anticipating something so uh, sometimes we don't know which patient uh, i'll have difficult uh, mask uh, ventilation so at least some uh, areas uh, we have this benefit and what uh, apex sir has told about squeezing the capacity to squeeze this area with the laryngoscopy and all that uh, that uh, that we really don't know whether we will be able to displace or squeeze and how much it can be moved because that cannot be done with ultrasound unless somebody is doing a real time laryngoscopy and then we are measuring these distances uh, so that's a different topic altogether but uh, tongue volume and other things people have calculated but again this it requires many calculations and unless you have some background of uh, uh, special training in this area all those fine tuning or you have a radiologist friend then you can still progress in this a little bit of practice will give you fair idea about the airway but uh, many areas are still being explored and uh, you will be astonished to see how people are working so aggressively in this area Sir, is there any uh, specific uh, grading system for uh, prediction of uh, difficult airway when you use ultrasound with ultrasound? Uh, uh, the paper which I showed uh, has uh, has uh, come up with every every test has got its own uh, uh, values and cutoffs depending on what material methods they have utilized. So, if like skin to epiglottis, mid epiglottis, most of the papers showed two centimeter as cut off, or tongue thickness as five point eight to six as cut off, uh, and the higher mental distance ratio. So, you have to choose two, three, um, at least three uh, is one of the recommendation. You combine these and then try to see with individual cut off, and then you can predict uh, this. Uh, so, difficult airway. Uh, some of the aggressive uh, people using airway ultrasound, they are convinced that we are still in the developing area in uh, as far as difficult airway prediction. So first we have to start more with normal airway and most of the papers which are talking about all these have not included uh, difficult airway in their study design. So, if you critically analyze this paper, the the sample size uh, is not having. Some studies do have included obese patients and difficult airway, but most of them are like uh, straightforward airways. And then we are trying to extrapolate in difficult airway. So, still we'll have to wait for that. Uh, but yes, uh, as we have started parking the probe at a time of intubation, as we have doing prophylactic cricothyroid puncture as we have any airway pathology we would like to scan. Even uh, two days back, uh, somebody asked me, they were doing parathyroid surgery and we have just scanned the thyroid gland and we could show a lot of vessels, we could show cysts and this could help the surgeon in real-time planning of incision though there was an ultrasound report. Uh, so, uh, uh, putting a probe will help you to develop uh, ask. Uh, developing uh, uh, for asking the right question. So unless uh, you do more scans uh, and lot of uh, and uh, try to see what is the question and if we can answer this, somebody was asking me, uh, what about uh, you know uh, presence of a fistula or presence of a, you know a parapharyngeal abscess or something. So we have placed the probe. We have seen the abscess. This. You can see a hypoechoic cavity. You can help and draw, you know, put a caliper and measure the distance and help the surgeon. So, unless you have a very specific question, where should be my incision on this whole surface, which is all swollen up? Uh, where is the thyroid gland? Sometimes, you know, in a thyroid patient, they, we cannot identify trachea uh, by manual method. So just placing an ultrasound probe will help us, uh, like it is extreme left, the trachea has gone. And uh, at least we have some idea where to, uh, how to push, how to maneuver. So you have to develop a skill set of asking right question and try to analyze if ultrasound is helping. So 
most of the articles are after 2014-15, so it is still seven, eight years, ten years, and we are growing ahead with uh, all this uh, evidence. Hopefully, I have answered. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, even even uh, recently, we have uh, we have seen that lot of uh, thyroid cases. We can do that a level of uh, deviation of the trachea before we uh, place the. Yes, uh, well, the surgeons are scared. You know, sometimes people th think that our uh, our uh, protection is ENT surgeon. But when I have called uh, ENT surgeon for all these difficult cases, they were equally scared as anybody else. They said, okay, you called us, but you tell us what to do because nothing can be done most of the time. The structures are so thick, difficult to palpate. How can I get you? You will have to do fiber optics somehow. So we showed them the trachea, we pl placed some, you know, uh, small puncture there. There is a guidance and then they can work on that area and try to fix it. But it's a challenge and airway is always an emergency. And as a perioperative physician, as a anesthetist, we are looked upon as the leader in this area. So all everyone else depend on us to help us place the tube. So all these airway gadgets uh, uh, kit for advanced airway and everything should be ready. And therefore, uh, in COVID times, we have invested a lot of uh, money with uh, our department has uh, video laryngoscope, high frequency, nasal oxygenation cannula. We do have pediatric fiber optic scope uh, for confirmation of DLT. And uh, I think it's worth investing in airway gadgets uh, because uh, it's, a, it's a very, very crucial step and one chance. Uh, so all those airway gadgets, even we have the LMA protector and other things also. And we have, it is, it is beneficial. I mean, it's uh, even when you have the LMA placed, you can, so you, it's a, it's a, like if you are passionate about it with the ultrasound and focus, you have some different question. You try to analyze, we just see and we find answers and uh, I was just explaining, re-emphasizing how the bougie was placed and three times it has gone in esophagus. Now think of a situation if we would have really railroad and passed the tube and then checked, it would have created a lot of mess and anxiety and stress and uh, re increased risk of uh, all the catastrophe. So uh, it is helping us. I mean, if any interrogation, any intervention is helping to change my decision, uh, I think it is a very good intervention. So, and ultrasound has helped us uh, that we could say, no, 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 this tube has not gone in or, you know, it's not trachea, it's not precothyroid membrane, uh, it's not the endobronchial intubation has happened, your tube has gone excessively in, this probably is the not the right size tube. Uh, here, the tracheal diameter after post tracheostomy patients, all those, no, where CT scan, Sometimes they show some small chinks sometimes. So dynamic airway assessment can be done with the help of ultrasound because uh, the airway size may change with breathing. Uh, that cannot be picked up in each and every CT film because it may it depends on when the shot was taken. So sometimes it may show very small chinks sometimes. So there are advantages, disadvantages. And of course, uh, ultrasound is again an observer dependent technique. So more and more you are refined in that area, you will be, uh, you will be able to predict in a better way. Yes. So one last question, sir. Uh, role of ultrasound in airway blocks as a regional anesthesiologist. Yeah, so that I, <laughs> that I have not covered. Uh, but if you could see the Adam's apple uh, the and then the hyoid bone. So in between is the thyrohyoid membrane. And this thyrohyoid membrane, uh, if you block anywhere, it will involve the superior laryngeal nerve. So this is the superior laryngeal nerve block. Most of the time, people palpate the hyoid bone and the cornu and then they just below beneath the hyoid bone. So basically, they are infiltrating with the local anesthetic in the thyrohyoid membrane and it is causing a, a good block there. Uh, another is a transtracheal installation, which can be aided with ultrasound and help to get the right puncture. The glossopharyngeal nerve block and again requires little bit of training and it's uh, it's uh, uh, most of us don't do it actually. So these two blocks, the superior laryngeal and the transtracheal installation with ultrasound, uh, because many times we poke the needle and there is no airflow. So why not just place a probe and just do it in a one go? Because uh, the patients are much more comfortable with that. So that 
can be beneficial uh, another area is people have done mandibular nerve block and uh, maxillary nerve block and other areas for commando surgeries and other that is another complete area of discussion thank you sir thank you thank you for an excellent uh, presentation and discussion uh, edward sir any other questions you have sir or shall we Uh, sir, I would like to know comment of Apex sir uh, in few areas about uh, ultrasound. What is his sir, take? And... Sir, okay, sir, is are you there, sir? Not there. Okay, okay, okay. Sir, so thank you very much for thank you. excellent presentation by the two speakers, Dr. Amit and Dr. Apex. They have thrown a mm -hmm. more light on the understanding of the airway. Thank you very much, sir, Apex sir and Amit sir. And also, I thank, thank the coordinator, Dr. Rajesh J. Prakasar also. I thank the sponsor, Akrula, and the uh, media partner, that is Anasisa TV. And also, I uh, thankful to the host, A1 Logics. Thank you, one and all. We will meet the next month with uh, another interesting topic. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, you, thank, sir. You. thank you, Dr. Edward and Dr.